Hello, I want to welcome you to the National Good Food Network webinar, Building Local Government Support for Good Food. This webinar is being co-sponsored by the Community Food Security Coalition, an NGFN partner organization. Uh, let me just give you a very brief introduction to the webinar software we're using so that you can get most, the most out of your uh, webinar with us today. Your webinar screen looks like this. There's the slide presentation over here on the left and the control panel on the right. Over in the control panel is a questions box. You're muted during the presentation, so please use the question box to type in your questions for our presenters. You uh, may also see some answers to questions or other messages there as well. The webinar will be archived on the ngfn.org uh, website. Go to ngfn.org slash webinars. You'll also find all of the previous NGFN webinars archived there. If you've missed any, that's the place to go. And finally, I encourage you to complete our post-webinar survey. It'll take just a minute and really helps us to continue to improve our webinars and our outreach. So now let me introduce uh, Marty Garenser, uh, the program manager for the National Good Food Network, and she's going to describe uh, a little bit about what their network is and what we do. So, um, Marty? Hello everyone, my name is Marty Garenser. Welcome to the webinar today. It's our pleasure to have you and we're grateful to have such a large crowd today. Um, and thanks, special thanks to Community Food Security Coalition for being a sponsor and partner to this webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you just a little bit more about the NGFN and then we'll go on to the presentation for today. Jeff, I'm just, oh, there we go. There we go. The NGFN started through many conversations between the Wallace Center and myself and many regional food systems leaders from around the country. Together we, we have great admiration and learned about a lot of the different direct forms of sales through farmers markets and CSAs. And we saw the opportunity to provide impact in scaling up and moving more healthy food into communities, especially those where children and families live in rural and urban areas throughout the country. So the Wallace Center and many regional food systems leaders from around the country got together and concepted and developed this National Good Food Network, a national coordinating organization that's goal is to assist regional leaders and communities in the work that they do in food systems efforts to scale up and move more good food through efficient means into our communities and in particular into those vulnerable communities that lack food access in rural and urban areas throughout the country. We have 10 different regions that are in operation now through the Good Food Network spanning throughout the country and we do a lot of work building regional networks and again helping our communities connect and learn how to build regional food systems where we can get more good food into those communities. And the Wallace Center's focus on market-based solutions has proven to be a great place to launch and house the NGFN. We believe through the NGFN we'll, we'll increase our odds at, at increasing small and medium-sized grower viability, adding economic vitality to our rural and urban areas, and most importantly, reach children and families directly where they live with that healthy food in rural and urban areas, reducing poverty, racism, and reducing food deserts in rural and urban areas throughout the country. The NGFN at the national level serves as an operating communications hub for folks like you today and other regions throughout the country. We connect people to people, people on the ground. We connect to regional food systems experts, like the ones that you're here from today. We connect people to models, models that have been proven in other regions so that you can escalate your work and save you time in doing the work in your regions. And we connect people to sources of regional and national funding. On our NGFN.org website, a growing number of people are adding their names and their profiles to the webinar so that they can network and connect, learn and share from each other, in addition to the more formalized ways like this webinar today. And our Cisco partnership, our on-the-ground projects, are proving 
that we can connect local growers into the mainstream food system. And through the Cisco warehouse, we've been able to reach urban schools, like in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Kansas City, Kansas, and also move healthy food into universities, hospitals, restaurants, and other outlets. We're also building community. Our regional leads are constantly bringing together diverse leaders from their region and communities to think about new ways to build this regional food system and build the National Good Food Network. We're constantly looking to add impact to our work. And we're national collaborators and partners with Community Food Security Coalition, like this webinar today, National Farm to School Network, School Food Focus, National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, and we've entered into discussions with Why Hunger and Real Food Challenge. Here's a quick look at the goals of the NGFN. Again, supply meeting demand is, means more good food moving into our communities and looking at ways we can do that efficiently and effectively with you all. The information hub is that the NGFN wants to be your go-to place for regional food system stories and methods and in partnership with our national collaborators and our advisory council. And policy is an area that we started working more on this year to assist our national partners like NSAC, National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, to inform them of work going on on the ground so that they have more stories to share with our lawmakers that will further the goals of the National Good Food Network and I know you all. Here's a look, a quick look at the map, the national map. Again, we, we extend throughout the country. We're in New York, LA, Chicago, and Detroit urban areas, and rural areas in New Mexico, the Midwest, and the Southeast. Together, our regional leads and our partners assist the regions and communities to look at ways to build our regional food systems and move more good food into those communities. Here's a list of our advisory council. Again, these folks were with us from the start, working on the ground and advising our National Good Food Network. They've been integral to building and developing this national network. And here's a quick look at the regional lead teams. Again, they span throughout the country. Uh, all of their, the advisory council and the regional lead teams' websites and more information about the work they're doing in their regions are on their websites, and we have links on ours at ngfn.org. So that's a quick look at the National Good Food Network. Again, I thank you for being on the call today. We hope you enjoy the webinar. And now Jeff Arvin will introduce today's presenters. Thanks, Marty. Um, uh, just a, a quick outline of the, the presentation. Mark Winnie uh, will present first, uh, and then Paul Hubbard. And then we'll have uh, a, a Q&A session. Um, so, uh, but I do want to encourage you to um, write in your question whenever, whenever you, you have your question. Uh, there, there will be some uh, text answers, uh, uh, and uh, we, we just want to make sure you have time to get your, your questions answered. Uh, so, uh, from 1979 to 2003, Mark Winnie was the executive director of the Hartford Food System, a private nonprofit agency that works on food and hunger issues in Connecticut. He is the co-founder of the Community Food Security Coalition, the co-sponsor of this webinar, where he now works as the Food Policy Council Project Director. As a writer on food issues, Mark's work has appeared in the Washington Post, The Nation, Sierra Magazine, Orion Magazine, and Yes Magazine, to name a few. His first book, Closing the Food Gap, Resetting the Table on the Land of Plenty, was released in 2008. Mark's second book, Food Rebels, Gorilla Gardeners and Smart Cookin' Mamas is scheduled for release in October 2010. Both books are published by Beacon Press. In addition to writing, Mark speaks to groups across the world on topics related to community food systems, food policy, and food security, for instance this webinar, and was recently appointed to the position of visiting scholar at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. He also serves on the boards of several nonprofit organizations in his home state of New Mexico, as well as other, in other parts of the country. Mark. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody, uh, all of you local food policy wonks. Uh, welcome aboard. I'm going to try to give you a uh, very quick and dirty look at what are the opportunities that might be available to you to influence your food system at a local level. Um, and I'm going to divide my presentation in the three parts, roughly, anyway. The first is going to be an overview of local food policy, 
what do we mean by that? Why is it important? Uh, why should we care? And how do we go about engaging in some meaningful way um, in our efforts to try to use our local food system and our local policy channels, trying, trying to find ways to bring them together? The second part, I'm going to look more specifically at food policy councils. Uh, I should note that uh, during my time in Hartford, Connecticut, I was the founder of the City of Hartford Food Policy Council in the early 1990s, and later on I was the founder of the uh, Connecticut Food Policy Council, state of, that was the first state food policy council in the country. After moving to New Mexico, I worked with groups here on the New Mexico Food Policy, Food and Agriculture Policy Council, as well as the uh, more recently formed Santa Fe Food Policy Council. Um, and I have been working now for about three or four years with the Community Food Security Coalition, providing training and technical assistance. Um, so I'm going to be looking at food policy councils uh, briefly um, during my, the second portion of my presentation. In the last portion, I'm going to be talking about um, the role of uh, what are the actual issues and uh, successes, and what have the outcomes been um, of food, local food policy work, as well as some ideas about where we might go from here. I uh, should note, though, right from the beginning, that uh, through my job at the Community Food Security Coalition, um, <clears throat> I uh, provide training and technical assistance to communities all over the country, state level, local level, uh, county level, regional level, on the development of food policy councils. So I'm available to help you. Uh, we have a website at the foodsecurity.org. There will be some of this information in the slides to come. And uh, we also have a Food Policy Council listserv. Uh, you can sign up for that by just simply sending me an email asking to be put on that listserv. I provide consultation via phone and email to groups. We have a lot of resources available to groups who are interested in trying to start food policy councils or in trying to uh, understand or and use information that's been developed elsewhere on how to actually implement uh, specific food policies in, in their local areas. And lastly, I am available uh, on, you might say, for uh, special occasions uh, to come out to communities and actually do trainings on site. <clears throat> so those are some of the ways you can utilize the Community Food Security Coalition and our Food Policy Council services. Let me get into the first slide, and um, whoops. So this is a little bit more about what we do and who I am and so forth. But I actually want to just uh, spend a few minutes trying to answer the question: Why local food policy? Why? should we care and how can we use it. So I think the what I have learned over the course of, of many, many years of doing this is that the projects that we're undertaking at the local level, many of the uh, efforts to you know, do the dozens of food projects that we have all been engaged in for oh, 30 or 40 years now from starting farmers markets to urban gardens to trying to expand uh, the network for local food, distribution channels, farm to school, you name it, all these projects are effective ways to get good food into areas uh, that don't have it, they're good ways of uh, you know, making our food system more responsive, more just, more sustainable. Uh, but in and of themselves, I often found that just weren't enough. We really needed to engage policy, public policy, in order to expand that effort. Most of my work, uh, I will note, was in uh, a city, Hartford, and later in the state of Connecticut. And I found that I could start to engage uh, local policymakers in the work of improving our food system. Um, now, I think that the opportunity here is significant because it is the place that you should know the best. Um, and it is the place where I think we can be closest to democracy. 
if we can't make our system work at a local level, and by local I, I'm going to mean city, I'm going to mean municipality, I mean uh, county, and in some cases we have metro government or quasi-governmental institutions that operate at the metro or regional levels. And today, for the purposes of our discussion, I'm going to leave aside the, uh, what the opportunities are for state food policy. That's kind of a whole other area. And I think that this is where there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for us to engage uh, local policy um, uh, initiatives and functions in order to actually change our food system. Let me give you some just quick examples by, in terms of functions. Think about your local government in terms of a, a set of functions, such as education, land use and planning, health, public health, economic development, parks and recreation, purchasing or procurement, the delivery of social services, including food assistance programs like food stamps and WIC, child nutrition programs in schools, and transportation. And I'm probably missing a few functions there, but it's been my experience that you can find ways within all of those functions to make the food system operate more effectively and to bring about the kind of sustainable, locally focused, um, looking at the potential of a local food economy, for instance, by engaging those functions. Um, and more generally, um, I think that what we can do at a local level, in addition to the kind of usual functions that government uh, utilizes in order to do its work, we should think about these as well. What about public awareness? Uh, what about the bully pulpit that's available within, say, City Hall? I always like to tell the story of the mayor of Hartford who was a kind of a typical Northeast roly-poly kind of guy uh, who decided that he was going to lose some weight. And this was became a symbol of Hartford's effort to lose weight as well. And you know that was a way that we could highlight the issue and the problems of food, of uh, obesity and uh, food deserts and other issues that were having a negative impact on the health and well-being of the community. Um, the, the resources that government brings to the table, funding, financing, simply their budgets, all of that is fair game for people who want to look at how they can engage, engage government in food policy work. Regulations, permits, zoning, reg, uh, resolutions, and ordinances that, that cities typically pass are also ways that you can make put food on the table. And I, by that I mean on the, on the table of city government or of county government. You know, it's using, basically you're, you're looking at how you can use the existing tools of government in order to make food an important part of their concern. Um, and I'm also finding, and this is perhaps a more recent event or a recent occurrence, is that uh, city governments, county governments also, are becoming a focal point for some of the big issues, the big sort of macro items that we're now seeing on our, in, our, um, in our sort of national food system. Uh, take, for instance, the work that has gone on in New York City to uh, ban trans fats. Um, you know, all the work, for instance, that uh, was largely initiated by Mayor Bloomberg um, has captured the national attention, the national spotlight. Uh, work that has been done that started out in Philadelphia, for instance, to look at the failure of the supermarket industry to serve uh, people in everybody equally without, throughout, um, um, uh, throughout the city of Philadelphia led to the creation of the Fresh Food Financing Initiative, which is providing financing for the development of new supermarkets, both in urban and rural areas of Pennsylvania. This is a model that is now becoming uh, replicated in other states and now even nationally. Um, we even see uh, opportunities sometimes to, uh, you might say, piggyback onto other big, bigger, big ticket initiatives such as obesity reduction, 
and sustainability. These are all items that are now, for the most part, commonplace in city governments around the country. And again, I think our objective here overall, there's one thing I want you to remember out of this presentation, is that it is our job to try to put food on the agenda of, of government uh, at the local level. And I think it can be done oftentimes through these new initiatives, such as obesity reduction or promoting sustainability. I've even seen opportunities to take on some of the, uh, the more controversial issues of the day, such as uh, uh, GMOs. Uh, I'll tell a story a little bit later about what happened in Boulder, Colorado, and how the Food Policy Council there became embroiled in a particularly controversial issue to, um, uh, to decide how they were going to, how public land was going to be used to produce food. Now, lastly, I want to just give you some thoughts on where you begin with all of this. Um, it can, you can begin really anywhere, uh, but typically you can uh, convene a group of stakeholders. Uh, and I, when I say stakeholders, I really like to, like to see a broad representation of the community, um, broad in terms of, of uh, both public and private sector broad in terms of for-profit and non-profit, broad in terms of, of uh, and diverse in terms of race and income, community organizations, neighborhood associations sometimes, uh, the farm community, and uh, urban, urban agriculture. Sometimes it should be, food banks should be involved. A number of different interests, in other words, should be represented in the in, particularly in the early stages of trying to create an organized effort to influence policy at the local level. And so I want to emphasize two things in terms of what our purpose is in organizing our, our, our resources and organizing the different stakeholders. And for me, the two purposes that really count are, number one, that we're trying to coordinate the efforts of all the food system stakeholders. We're not going to get everybody. But it should, we should be making a very serious attempt to be inclusive of as many interests and uh, segments of our community as possible. Now the second point, and this is what I think distinguishes this whole kind of food policy council direction from other perhaps more coalition-oriented food efforts, is that we do need to influence policy. Many groups get organized and they call themselves food policy councils or food policy council networks or coalitions um, or many other terms have been used, but they don't seem to really exist to try to address policy. To me, this is a very, this is a very critical distinguishing feature that we need to keep in mind. So again, to coordinate our work as food system stakeholders and also to um, influence our local policy. Now, let's, let me say a word about jurisdictions. Um, I do think that you know, if we're going to be serious about influencing policy, we do need to focus on specific jurisdictions. Uh, some groups have organized around sort of a larger kind of food shed uh, concept, and that's fine. But if we're going to influence policy, we're going to influence it within a specific city or a specific county. Or again, if there's a metro or regional form of government or quasi-governmental institutions, that's what you're going to be focusing on. So you need to keep that in mind. Now, in, we're seeing more multi-jurisdictional uh, food policy efforts emerging. Um, for instance, in the Kansas City area, I believe there are nine counties, uh, four of which are in the state of Kansas, five of which are in Missouri. And uh, this effort is a, a kind of a good model of what we can do on a sort of larger uh, region basis, but they've been very specific so far, as far as I can tell, about focusing on specific jurisdictions and what those jurisdictions can do. Another key factor in getting started is certainly knowing your food system. How do you do that? Well, community food assessments are one tool. Actually getting out and getting information about your food system is, is pretty critical. 
you need to inform yourselves about what you're doing. And you need to inform yourselves about what the needs are. You need to inform yourselves about what the resources are. And in the process of doing that kind of research, and this and I'm by this kind of research, I'm referring to pretty much off the shelf kinds of data and information uh, that uh, you know we can use. I should I should note at this point that I'm going to be getting into more uh, that I'm staying on this for a slide for this for the moment because I'm providing you with background information. The rest of the slides will go into more detail. So I see some people are a little concerned that I'm stuck, but uh, I'm not exactly stuck. I'll be moving the slide in a minute. So it's important for you to gather information about your food system. And I also, I also recommend t taking it one step further in the interest of influencing policy, and that's to conduct a food policy inventory, actually going into government and finding out what it is doing now or what it could do to influence the food system. This is something that is, sort of, is not necessarily intuitive for people. Um, government is complex. It's confusing. It often isn't particularly rational. But it certainly has a variety of functions that you can utilize in order to accomplish your objectives. I also think it's important to meet with your city or county officials before you even sort of launch your, your idea. Don't get too far out ahead of everybody else. Make sure that others are uh, at least with you or aware of what you're doing. Uh, when we were in the process of setting up the Santa Fe Food Policy Council, I believe we met with just about every member of the county commission. We met with this, this, the mayor of the city of Santa Fe. We met with several members of the city council, uh, oftentimes individually, oftentimes taking them out to lunch. And we were able to reduce the resistance and we were able to increase the buy-in by making this kind of very personal effort to uh, explain what we meant by a food policy council and to explain what we thought the issues were. All right, now I'm going to move into a, a discussion, a more thorough discussion of food policy councils themselves. All right, I, I often, sorry, I am uh, still mastering the uh, operation of the keyboard. I'm not going to spend much time on these first on the on this on this first slide. I just want to point out that I do think, as I mentioned, we have projects, we have partners, we have policies. Three P's. I think we're doing a great job with projects. I think we're doing a great job with partnerships, but I do think we're weak in the policy arena. So we need, do need to. That's where we need to focus. Now, what is food policy? I go down to my last point here. I think it's actually the actions and inactions of all levels of government that influence the supply, quality, price, et cetera, of food. And notice that I say inaction as much as action, because I believe that if a government doesn't take a position on a certain issue, um, if they have no, in effect, they have no policy on, let's say, obesity or land use to promote community gardens or on the loss of farmland within their region, then that is really, in effect, a policy. So I like to point that out to people. Now, it's also interesting to note All right, I have to catch up with myself. that no state or local government has a Department of Food. Now, given how important uh, food is, and I think we would all agree on that, um, the fact that we don't have any central focus for it is critical. Think about all those functions of government that I just suggested. All of them, in my experience, can play a major role with, foods, with our food system, education, land use planning, etc., economic development. But no place is there a place, or no place within government is there a place where we can all sit down together. No, there's no place where we can bring in the private sector and the nonprofit sector. And the idea of a food policy council is that it, in effect, becomes a de facto department of food. It becomes a table of experts and stakeholders and people who have some who really care about the food system 
and also have the ability to do something about it. I think it's also useful to think about food policy councils as a food system planning venue. Where else can we actually systematically do planning work? Uh, particularly if we don't have a Department of Food, well, we then end up dispersing all those activities to a number of places uh, where they often are left dispersed and there's no central focus. Again, a food policy council can become that central focus and it can become that food system planning venue. We're talking about something that also is connecting a number of dots, nutrition and health, food security, natural resources, the local food economy. I always like to tell people that your food economy is, is your second largest food, uh, economic sector, uh, in most places anyway, behind the healthcare industry. And if we looked at all the contributions, uh, looked at the value of our food economy in any, in any county or any city, if we looked at all the jobs that are connected to food, we'd see that it was a very significant economic force. And yet there is no place that takes us typically no place that takes a look at our food economy uh, or no place that takes a look at all the, all the ways that we can connect the dots. Now, membership. Who should be at the table? Well, lots of different people. I've already gone through this again, but I do, I do, I've, I've seen this happen on occasion where groups get together and they're only interested in urban agriculture or they're only interested in doing anti-hunger work or they're only interested in promoting local food. I tend to try to encourage those groups to become much broader than that because your food system is much broader than that. Um, let me see. And uh, this last point on this slide, food policy councils tend to be advisory. This is important. It's only elected officials that can actually make policy. I was reprimanded or scolded one day by a county commissioner who said, what is a food policy council? Uh, do you guys think you can actually make policy? I'm the elected person in this county. I'm the only one who's able to make policy. And this guy was right. And we then went back and started to explain what we mean by advisory. Because we are a body of experts. We, become, we are appointed, most, in most cases, by local government. And we are there to try to come up to look at our food system carefully, come up with recommendations, and advise our elected officials on what they can do about their food system. Now, I also think it's important for food policy councils to work across government lines and to look for all the intersections between local government, state government, and often federal government. Um, and you know, this is this is where you begin to see how money flows from, say, the federal government to the to the state government to the local government. You're monitoring your food system. You are the people who are going to try to make this government make government work with respect to food. So you have to understand how all these threads connect. Food policy. I think an important function of food policy councils is public education and awareness. This is something uh, which is so often an underutilized resource. Uh, there's a lot you can do to tell the food system story that educates the public in general and your policy makers. Now let's take a quick look at the organizational issues. This is a very complicated area and one where a lot of groups get bogged down. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But it, if you can imagine a spectrum from one end of the spectrum where uh, a group is organized and officially sanctioned by government through a city ordinance, for instance, or a county resolution, well, that is a group that is really embedded in government. It is officially a part of government. It has its. It has a. Uh, it, in the case of Santa Fe, we have a six or seven page document that does two things. First, it establishes a policy, a food policy, which is a, a fairly eloquent statement of of goods important purposes like promoting access to healthy food for everybody, protecting our farmland so that we can have food, uh, produce our own food in our region. Uh, those kinds of things. And the second part is that it actually establishes the Food Policy Council. We have model documents on all these things that we can make available. But at the other end of the spectrum are those Food Policy Councils that are organized independently. They have no official connection to government. However, they often, and I strongly recommend, 
that they have a that they have working partnerships or relationships with government. This is really critical. Uh, I don't think in today in this day and age that you can effectively influence policy if you're not working directly with government. Uh, we're not in. You know, I I can uh, say. Uh, that I was one of those people in the old days that would uh, you know, holler at City Hall and scream at them for not doing this or not doing that. I found that I can actually be more effective these days by working closely with them. So um, let me move on. Okay, uh, I'm let me go back to that slide. All right, I'm going to go right in. I'm going to go right into the issues at this point, um, in the interest of time, because I kind of think this is where the nuts and bolts of the whole discussion is, and um, it is. This is work. Actually, this is work at a local level and working with local government that is very much about nuts and bolts of food policy. Um, it's sometimes not very glamorous. Um, you, I often kind of. Uh, tease people a little bit that these local food policy councils are not where they're going to take on the oligopolistic forces of multinational agribusiness. This is not where you're going to fight the glorious fights for uh, a new alternative food movement. But you're going to hold government accountable. You're going to put food on their map. You're going to put food on the public policy agenda. And that takes a lot of very sort of on-the-ground work. Again, knowing how your government works uh, and knowing how you can bring people together and create a consensus. Now, in New Mexico, uh, I, I don't want to get too much into the state policies, but I do want to just mention this one, that the New Mexico Food and Agriculture Policy um, Council uh, was responsible for actually creating nutrition rules that govern the use of competitive foods in the public schools. Now, while they did that at the state level, there's a lot of work to enforce that at the local level. Paying it you know, once, and let's keep this in mind, let's make sure we understand this distinction about policy, that you can do two things with policy. You can formulate it, in other words, you can actually create policy, but you also have to implement it. And it's the implementation which is often a much harder task. And, and that requires a group that knows their food system and knows their government and it acts, in effect, as a watchdog and holds government accountable for what it's doing. And in the case of these farm, of these nutrition rules, I think it's important for local food policy councils to really pay attention and make sure that those rules are being implemented. Um, let me go take a look here at Cleveland. Cleveland, I, I often use as kind of the poster child these days of local food policy work partly because they've kind of taken a, a seat to a table approach in the, the way that they've gone about looking at, at uh, local, uh, local policy in their local food system. They've started off with providing a little bit of funding out of their economic development department to promote urban agriculture, small, literally seed money, small amounts of money that are loaned or granted to new urban farmers. They then tried to expand uh, urban gardening and even urban farming by providing uh, protection through zoning. They actually made changes in their zoning regulations in order to protect community gardens and to promote larger scale of one acre or larger in size lots that can be classified as urban farms. Uh, they've also uh, passed, they made, they made uh, uh, regula regulatory changes that permitted the raising of chickens and bees in the back backyards of Cleveland uh, homeowners or property owners. And they then decided to look at their purchasing power, their, their procurement systems, and how can they use procurement to actually encourage um, <clears throat> the purchase of locally grown food. And they have, and they passed just this spring, uh, what I think is a model procurement regulation that gives first preference to local locally grown food for public institutions such as schools and prisons and hospitals and um, actually gives a preference uh, to uh, organic and sustainably produced food and uh, preference not only to, when I say local 
I'm talking very local, like food that's actually grown in the city, within city limits, and then as well as food that's grown within the, within the region. Um, so kind of a pretty much of a model in terms of how we can utilize the entire, uh, all, almost all the functions that you can imagine within government. And I want to say one important, there's an important learning tool here, I think, from or a lesson from Cleveland. It's twofold. One is the Food Policy Council played a very important role. And there were many other partners, including some great work that was done by Ohio State uh, Extension. But there was a great leader in the city council whose name is Joe Simperman, who really got the idea of food. Now, I think it's important for you to cultivate those kinds of people. Make them your best friends. Find out who they might be. I'm seeing this more often than not these days that, that one elected official, such as a city council person or a um, county commissioner, can make a huge difference. And uh, seeking out that person and cultivating them is something that really can be effective. We're not going to talk about Missoula, because we'll hear about that in a minute, but in Boulder County, uh, this is an interesting story where a new food policy council had just a year old, still wet behind the years, had to uh, uh, decide on whether or not genetically modified sugar beet seeds could be planted on 25,000 acres of publicly owned farmland in the county of Boulder. The county had the foresight many years ago to actually acquire this much land for open space, for farming and ranching and had leased a good portion of that land for farming and ranching. Uh, the request came in to uh, use genetically modified seed, and that ball got kicked over to the Food Policy Council. Led to a great deal of debate, a lot of consternation. It was a really tough, tough issue. Uh, they came out voting against it. <clears throat> but I think more, and more importantly is it led, it opened the door to the creation of a sustainable, of developing a plan for, this, for sustainable agriculture and the sustainable use of that 25,000 acres. To start thinking about food they could grow on that land that could actually be used by local citizens instead of the kind of commodity uh, corn, sugar beet, and other crops that were primarily being grown at that point. Uh, Fresno, California is another good example where a food policy group working with the planning office. I can't underestimate, I can't understate how important uh, planning is these days. The planners are really becoming the heroes of the local food movement. Another group you want to cultivate and make, make them your best friends. Um, there they were able to protect a, a community garden through making zoning changes. They were actually able to bring farmers markets into Fresno, which is sort of a big duh considering that it's in uh, the Central Valley of California. But farmers markets were actually uh, prohibited uh, from operating in Fresno. So zoning changes were necessary in order to bring farmers markets. And they even they took this to the next step further, and what they did is to uh, they were annex, the city was annexing uh, 9,000 acres of uh, new land uh, into the city limits. And in that plan, a master plan for that land, they, they included farmers markets, community gardens, supermarkets, protected farmland, great way to kind of you know, utilize the planning capacity. Um, one more example from my old hometown of, of Hartford. This is another going kind of in the other direction, but it goes to my point about what's your role as an ombudsman. You're there, I think, to represent and protect the interests and to engage the interests of those who don't really have a voice, who are often underrepresented in our food system. We found through bureaucratic ineptitude that our, our city WIC program had dropped 4,000 people from its caseload, 4,000 uh, um, lower income moms who weren't able to use their WIC benefits. I'm not going to go into why. It was very complicated, but the Food Policy Council advocated uh, on that issue and was able to make the changes necessary in order to correct it. We looked at the availability of public transportation to make sure that people could get from their from neighborhoods that did not have supermarkets to, uh, to uh, suburban areas that did have supermarkets. We did a transportation study. And from that study and from the advocacy that ensued, we were able to make um, changes in the bus routes and 
provide a direct connection from low-income neighborhoods to um, the uh, to, to supermarkets. Uh, many other cities are coming online. There's, like I said, there's over a hundred uh, over a hundred food policy councils in North America. About um, I think it's about 16 or 17 are actually state food policy councils. There's a, at least a dozen Canadian food policy councils, both uh, city and provincial, and the rest are local food policy councils. Um, some of the better stories are coming out of places like New York City, uh, Kansas City, where they, Kansas, the new Kansas City Food Policy Council was able to uh, make some changes in zoning, I believe, and regulations that uh, were able to encourage urban agriculture. Um, New York City is probably kind of a offers what I might call a blue sky situation, where some of you may have heard of the pronouncements of Manhattan Borough President Scott Stringer, who's talking about how they can change their education system to incorporate to do better food education for the millions of New York City uh, uh, public school students, how they can look at their entire regional food shed and how, what they need to do in order to protect and enhance that. Um, how they can make sure that food, good healthy food is available everywhere throughout the city. So they, they kind of are suggesting what I think the future looks like and where the opportunities are to go forward with um, uh, food policy work in the uh, country. There's a lot more I can say. I've run out of time and I, I really want to hear what, what's going on in uh, Missoula, which I know is a good story. Uh, but you can maybe look at some of these other slides uh, that you know, show that what I, we're starting to see full-time staff people actually come on board, or even part-time staff people in the city of Baltimore, Kansas City, uh, actual food policy council or food policy coordinators have been hired. Uh, here in Santa Fe, we have a half-time person working. This is good news, and I think it starts to starting to show how serious policymakers are taking this issue. There's funding available in some cases from cities and from the counties, from community community foundations are taking an interest in this. Uh, also, uh, national foundations like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and more most recently the Center for Disease Control has been putting up money to to encourage the development of food policy councils. I will leave it there. I'm done. I thank you for your attention, and again, I'm available to help. Uh, groups who are interested in starting or, or improving existing food policy councils. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. That was uh, a great overview. And um, here's a, uh, just a couple resources. Um, these are in the slides that I sent out earlier today. Uh, and uh, we will be posting these slides also uh, on uh, our website uh, at ngfn.org. So, um, uh, that you can refer to them there. Let me introduce Paul Hubbard now. Uh, Paul Hubbard from Missoula is the Land Use uh, Program Coordinator for the Community Food and Agriculture Coalition, the CFAC in Missoula, Montana. Paul's primary responsibilities are to coordinate the work of CFA CFAC's Land Use and Agricultural Viability Committee. Aspects of the job have included designing and managing LandLink Montana, a program to assist beginning farmers and ranchers, working with the Missoula City Council to draft and secure an ordinance that allows residents to keep up to six chicken hens, coordinating, coordinating CFAC members in participating in land use decisions and policies that affect working farm and ranch lands. Paul received a Master's of Science in Environmental Studies from the University of Montana in 2006, where he researched farm ranch transitions, land use planning and farmland preservation, economic development strategies to bolster agricultural viability, and the University of Montana's own Farm to College program. Paul. Jeff, thanks a lot. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present on some of the work happening in Missoula County, Montana. I think folks will find it it, our, our, the work we're doing speak back to several themes that Mark Winnie just touched on, including uh, the importance of having direct relations with government. Um, as advisors, as a food policy council, as advisors, we largely play an educational role often, so doing 
um, some, some good research and making sure the facts are an important part of policy making, ensuring that there's broad participation, including diverse voices within the food system and spanning multiple issues. And then the synergies I find very fascinating, I hope emerge in my presentation, those synergies that work across multiple levels of government and even uh, the uh, public, private, and nonprofit sectors. So um, first, I wanted to provide you with a little bit of context. And I don't know if I have control of these slides yet. Um, so a little bit of context is, um, you know, as Jeff mentioned, we worked closely with the city council to legalize chickens in the city. Uh, we've done quite a bit on farm and ranch land conservation work with, through land use planning at the city and county levels, um, essentially to try to uh, halt the permanent impacts that unfettered sprawl has on our working landscapes. Uh, working with beginning farmers and ranchers through our Landlink Montana program, you can see that's a picture of uh, one of the beginning farmers we've worked with and, and the wet, cool season this year in Montana has provided a lot of spinach and that's why he is devouring a mouthful of spinach. And then we also started the first farm to school program in the state of Montana uh, five years ago and it, as well as the first EBT program in Montana at farmers markets to make sure that folks can spend their food stamps on good fresh food. So um, what I'd like to do now is touch on some of the areas that I think really illuminate the relationships between uh, a food policy council like us that we, uh, with local government. And, and that's really uh, essential are, are those relationships. So I'd like to start with the beginning of CFAC because that, that was the, the real launching of our direct relationship with city and county government. And then also look at farm to school as a program with the lens of our relationship with the elected body as well as government staff and then also with the farm and ranch land conservation. So uh, this in 2005 Missoula City Council and County Commissioners unanimously passed a resolution to support the establishment of a food policy council that would advise them on food and ag policy um, aiming to bolster food security, and local sustainable agriculture. So essentially we got the local government's blessing to be their advisors and they also um, appointed one delegate from each elected body to serve on CFAC. So we immediately had direct um, access to government and their involvement in, in thinking strategically about the policies that shape our food system. But even before that, um, we, even before we came to the elected bodies for their blessing, CFAC's roots are in the diverse stakeholders representing different points of the food chain from the field to the fork. Here we see a picture that I think captures that diverse participation that makes all of our work possible. Right now we happen to be looking at a tour of working farms that we organized in Missoula's urban fringe. These are the farms that are basically in line to be the next subdivision. And, um, and here with the microphone is Chu Mua, a, a grower, uh, a mung grower um, who sells at the farmers markets and so he's teaching everybody about his production and marketing systems. But what I want to point you towards is the audience. In that audience are all three of Missoula's county commissioners, five city councilors, three senior planners in the city's planning office, two developers, five farmers, and then other people, just food citizens interested in uh, bringing their food system closer to home. Um, and, and in the last couple years, this, this tour took place in 2007, in the last couple years we've decided to expand that grassroots capacity by becoming a member organization and inviting much broader and greater public participation in the work of uh, creating food policies that, that make sense for the community. I think uh, the, the story of Missoula's Farm to School program really highlights the interplay and ongoing relationships between elected bodies and the program's effectiveness in strengthening a broken food system. Early in the program, in, in, in two, the program started in 2005 and I want to say in 2006 we passed a resolution uh, or we worked with the Missoula County School Board to pass a resolution to make an effort to procure Montana-grown food. 
and we intentionally left the definition of Montana grown a little bit nebulous. And we did so for two reasons. One, since there's much less teeth to a nebulous definition, it's a little easier for a cash-strapped school system to get behind it, and we did earn the school board's unanimous support. But then second, in implementing a, a more flexible definition, it gave it, it reduced the red tape for CFAC and the school central kitchen to work together in procuring food as close to the mission as possible. And that mission was, uh, was initially very shared between CFAC and the food services in wanting to purchase food that was farmed or ranched here in Montana. And if, we could, if it could also be processed here, then that's great too. Um, it, you know, it, was, it was grown or processed in Montana. Um, but the goal to, to be as close to the farm as possible. And, um, and, and so we worked with the schools together to, to build new relationships with growers that could meet the school's needs and also design school menus around what foods were seasonally available. And um, here, here on this slide you can see that it, we've had incredible success in significantly increasing the amount of locally produced food that is served in Missoula's K through 12 public schools. Um, in in 2005-2006, a little over 4,000 pounds to uh, the 2008 to 2009 school year, almost 43,000 pounds. And and I should note too that these figures uh, do not include dairy, which is a, a huge portion of the of the school's purchases, because. The, the dairy was already coming from Montana farms, the, the, the milk, not, not just all dairy, but the milk was already coming from Montana dairies. And so these figures really show the new relationship, the increase as a result of farm to school and food that was procured from Montana farms and ranches. Um, however, we, we, we find ourselves right now, we're currently back to the drawing board on what role a food policy council should play in bridging the gap between local farms in, and uh, Missoula schools. And, and, and we're rethinking this for three, for the, as a result of three different challenges that I think are insightful in the relationship between a food policy council and government. Um, one is a, just a supply issue. There's, there's few producers that we have found that can, that can new producers that we think can fill the, the school's needs, including the high volume the school's needs of, of processed product and, frankly, just a very low price. Um, but second is that we no longer get the data on the food sources where the, where the school is getting it. And you'll see that the most recent school year, there's a projected under, under the 50,000. And that's because we really don't know. In the, in the previous school years, we were getting all of the information on where food was coming from, figuring out what was sourced from local farms, and then looking for new opportunities to bring in more food locally and, and, and create relationships with farms. And, um, and so lastly, the, 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 the other challenge is that we still hold the, the definition of farm to school and the mission to be about sourcing food from local farms and the food, food services is, is um, okay with it being just processed in locally and not as interested in make, continuing to make the effort to find new farms for it, uh, to, to, for sourcing. So again, we're figuring out the role of, of what a food policy council should play there. And, and I should also mention that the whole other arm of farm to school is the educational component and we are continuing to develop food and agricultural curriculum and partnering with teachers to implement it. So there's a, there's a strong partnership there in the classroom. So now I'd, I'd like to shift gears and look at the farm and ranch land conservation work that CFAC is doing uh, in relation to, to local government along with local government and land use planning. Just to place us in the landscape of Missoula County, this picture shows the mountains in the background in the fertile valley soils in the foreground. It's essentially, this is, you're looking at a classic working ranch. There's irrigated pastures and hay fields, and then unirrigated grazing lands in the hillsides. But I don't want you to ignore the mountains in the, the, in, that are that where you see in the timbered areas, because most of Missoula County is covered with those mountains. This is, these are just some foothills up, up close. Um, because of the mountains, we're right in the heart of the Rocky Mountains, and be, because of that, 
less than 8% of the county's land has agricultural soils. And those, that 8% includes both grazing lands and croplands. So an even smaller percent is really suitable for um, intensive cropland agriculture. Furthermore, as you can see in this slide, much of that cropland and the, the, the farm and ranch land has already been converted to non-agricultural uses. So that 8% includes land that's already lost to development like you see here. Um, we're currently looking at an aerial photo of the Missoula Valley immediately west of the city. The soils you see here are some of the most fertile in the entire state of Montana, but they're also in close proximity to Montana's fastest growing metro area, which is the city of Missoula. So this unfettered horizontal development pattern, it, as you can imagine it continuing, it, um, it, it has a, it, the, the adjacent working farms ne next door are, you, you can imagine what their fate is. And that not only threatens that land, but the whole food system that depends on these lands to produce food. So CFAC has been engaging with local government at multiple levels of land use planning to change this pattern and create a new fate for the working farms and ranches. And here, you know, just to briefly touch on some of those, those multiple levels, we have worked on some of the nitty-gritty details of subdivision regulations, such as defining agriculture in a way that includes agricultural land um, so that when a subdivision comes up for review, you can actually measure those impacts in the loss of good soil. And we work with the plan on these types of regulatory issues. We work with the planning office, with city council and county commissioners, and again, it's that advisory role um, in supporting why why a change is needed. We've also through through our involvement, the planning office invited us to become an agency in the subdivision review process. So we actually review any a subdivision proposal any time it's proposed on farm or ranch land. And, um, and in doing so, we end up having quite a bit of collaboration with developers, again, the planning office and the elected bodies, and then stakeholder groups beyond our own coalition. We, we end up, um, you know, the, the issues of wildlife habitat come up as well within conservation and uh, of farmland. We've partnered with neighbors, with neighborhoods on their, uh, on helping them craft neighborhood plans that will be very strategic in prioritizing working farms and ranches and, uh, and, and the planning office in that, and as well on, as larger, on larger growth policy issues we've been involved in the last few years on different levels of that, which again involve multiple different uh, layers of, of government, elected bodies, government staff, and also the private sector. Um, so it is quite exciting work that happens entirely based on those relationships. Um, I wanted to end on one tangible example. Uh, I think I have time for that. Um, one tangible example is, is this is a subdivision proposal that came to us in January 2009. And, and it was the, the, the upper left corner is what, is what was proposed in, in, in January. And um, this is 75 acres of prime irrigated farmland. Again, this, this is some of the best in the whole state of Montana. It, it was not very far from that aerial photograph we just looked at. And the first subdivision proposal was pretty basic. It's pretty much what you see all the time. It's the same cookie cutter approach to creating residential lots. And so it was going to take all 75 acres of farmland and convert it to uh, five acre residential lots. And so we recommended that the county commissioners deny this proposal based on the unmitigated impacts to agriculture. Well, here, you know, this was, by the way, this was the 25th subdivision proposal we reviewed. So we had quite a bit of, of comments in, in our past, and throughout all of that was an educational process for the elected bodies and the planning office through, um, through kind of having CFAC in advising them. And finally, you know, the, the, they're really starting to listen, and, and, and they've always been listening, but they're really starting to feel that, you know, that CF we actually can act on these comments. And the planning office uh, 
looked at the developer and they said, look, you know, we agree with CFAC and we recommend that you get serious about mitigating the impacts to agriculture sooner rather than later. This is not something you want to duke out in front of the county commissioners. And so um, the developer then took us up on our invitation to sit down at the table with the planning office. So you had the developer, the planning office, and CFAC sitting around looking at this subdivision design. And we ended up coming up with the proposal you see in the bottom right-hand corner, which still includes a bunch of residential lots. In fact, there's one more residential res uh, right to build a residence there than in the first proposal. But it's contained. And it's contained to about 20 acres in size as the overall residential footprint versus 75. And then there's about 33 acres of farmland that is permanently protected so that we, there's no more hemorrhaging of, of incredible agricultural soil. Access to irrigation is maintained to that piece of farmland. And then in the bottom right-hand corner that says common area, that was really good riparian habitat. So it's protected as riparian habitat. So I wanted to end on that tangible example of these kind of multiple different sectors coming together and, and finding a common solution, um, which, uh, I don't know, I, I think that really speaks to some of the possibility of where of the role of a food policy council in looking at policy and the way government interfaces with food security. I, I think that's it for me. I'm, I'm uh, is, really excited to hear your questions. Yeah, that is a great. I, I, I love that you ended on that example. It's really very inspiring. Um, there are a few questions there, uh, and feel free to keep them coming. Um, we have a, a, a bit of time for questions. Um, uh, the first question for you, Paul, is uh, there an agricultural strategic plan for Missoula, and are you working with land trusts? Um, we, we are, we've done quite a bit of um, meeting with different land trusts. There's a, there's a significant challenge um, when it, in land use planning with, with, uh, cons with land trusts is that, you know, land trusts, land trusts have, are doing great. We're, we've got one land trust in Missoula County that has done amazing work over 25 years. And in working with landowners entirely on a voluntary basis, landowners that say, hey, I want to sell my development rights or, or donate my development rights, then that's really a, a place where the land trust is the most comfortable and, that, and that's where they work. When we start talking about requiring more developers to be a little bit more responsible, things get a little bit more controversial and it's important, I think, for the land trust not to alienate some of the landowners they might be able to work with in the future by, um, so it's kind of a, it's a little bit touchy, but the answer is yes, we've, we've uh, maintained quite good relationships with a lot of land trusts to, in order to hear insights from them on how to move forward and make sure that we, we move forward in a way that doesn't compromise the good work that's already happening. Great. In terms of the strategic plan for agriculture, uh -huh. the growth, the Missoula County and City Growth Policy is, has a very clear vision to um, support sustainable agriculture, support working farms and ranches. Even, it even explicitly says to dis distinguish between the urban uses of land and agricultural land. However, we have this vision, we don't have any implementation tools. And that's what's really challenging is essentially there's, there's nothing to, um, there's no teeth, there's no real concrete guidance on how to develop and grow in a way where we don't also uh, compromise our food security and, and the working farms and ranches that provide it. Mm -hmm. Mark, um, I'm going to try to piece together a few questions for you. Um, the questions are around what is uh, what are suggested uh, size of food policy council uh, and the governance structure, uh, and there are a couple questions on uh, how much how much does uh, should a local government expect to uh, pay? You know, what what are the costs involved with uh, taking on a food policy council? Okay, there's no uh, rule of thumb here, but um, I will say that um, I would I would recommend uh, no less than thirteen, and perhaps uh, no more than twenty one uh, members for a food policy council. Um, and in saying that. Please keep in mind that you can, um, in addition to those who may be officially appointed to a food policy council, 
add people who I, you can call them whatever you want, but I used to call them affiliate members, um, which can be an unlimited number perhaps of people who do have a, a broader, who have an interest in the food system and who for whatever reason weren't able to, um, you know, didn't, weren't able to, just didn't have enough room to appoint them to the Food Policy Council. So that kind of affiliate status gives you a, access to a much broader range of, of people and knowledge and so forth. Um, and a, a typical budget, let's say, for a local food policy council in Santa Fe, I think our budget is $50,000. Um, I, I think you really should be striving to get at least a half-time staff person. Um, I've run food policy councils uh, with only frankly with only interns and with no budget at all. It can be done. It's not easy and it's not desirable. But I'd say starting at $50,000 with a half-time professional level person who can be a consultant sometimes uh, is, is a good thing, is a good way to, sort of a good starting place. And I'd add to that that there's an important role for nonprofit sponsors, you might say, to provide in-kind resources including the government itself, can provide in-kind resources. Uh, we have the commitment of, uh, of, a, of a secretary, for instance, who, who uh, gets out notices, who keeps minutes, uh, who kind of helps us with some of that, those administrative chores. So there's different ways you can cobble together a budget. Okay, great. Um, and are, do you know of any examples of uh, healthcare professionals uh, being brought to a food policy planning? Was that for me, Jeff? Uh, yeah. Oh. I mean, Paul, feel free to weigh in. Uh, but oh yes, I mean, health health professionals are, are critical. Um, um, oftentimes, the um, a, a, a resolution or an ordinance establishing a food policy council will specify the city or county department of health. Uh, at the very least, you should have some lines of communication with that with, with health professionals. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes that can include also people with nutrition backgrounds and dietetics backgrounds. Um, so I, I think the there's enormous opportunities to link food systems to public health and health in general. And I think you should definitely make every effort possible to incorporate people with those kinds of backgrounds. Okay, great. Uh, makes makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, Cheryl and Lisa are both asking uh, about how how do you assess a community's needs? And wh how do you, you know what is what is that sort of initial assessment stage? Are, are there uh, tools uh, resources available to help with that? Well, the Community Food Security Coalition does have a community food assessment manual. It's a bit out of date, and uh, it's sometimes even hard for me to find it. <laughs> but if you go to the website, I think you'll be able to uh, track it down. But here's here's a, a kind of a quick and dirty way to think about it. Um, you should first of all have some local knowledge of your food system. I think you should be using already available data on food insecurity on obesity, on various kind of health indicators, um, looking at participation in existing food assistance programs, what have the trends been, how many people are using a food bank, what has the change been in that over the years, what's going on with land use, there's, there's data available from the USDA um, you know, uh, Ag Statistics Report that goes down to the county level, there's data available from USDA in this fairly new uh, food atlas which attempts to bring all of this together. Um, doing some mapping, using some, getting some assistance perhaps from planners and from perhaps from uh, local colleges or universities. Sometimes it's helpful to go out and actually conduct some focus groups or do some surveys so you are collecting a little bit of your own um, original data. But I think that a lot can be learned by looking at uh, existing uh, research and existing data. Uh, that almost every community has these days. Okay. Um, if I can chime in. Yeah, that'd be great. There, the, uh, the, I, the Missoula County Community Food Assessment has been enormously helpful for us at, at CFAC. It, it, it was done in 2004, 
and it's it, the first recommendation out of the uh, out of the community food assessment was to create a food policy council, and so that's the first thing that that we did. But the, the having all of that information in one place that really brought out what are what are some of the systemic weaknesses in our food system with the way we uh, grow, distribute, market, and eat food. It it really allowed us to be very strategic in, in the areas we were going to focus on and prioritize where we were going to you know, be the most effective. And we still go back to that data um, today. So having it all in one place, I, I agree with Mark, it, it's, it's a very daunting process and the extent to which someone would want to go out and get original data, you know, you'd have to figure that out. But having it all in one place and, it, and then a community process to digest it and bring many people in from different lenses is a great way to start building that diverse group of stakeholders and that, are, that are actually going to be a part of carrying the work out in, um, in the future. Jeff, I was reminded that on the Community Food Security's website, foodsecurity.org, we do have a number of community food assessment tools, not just a manual. And um, some good assessment tools and reports are available at that website. Great, and we will we will post a, a link to that. Uh, and I I feel terrible. There are several m more great questions, but uh, we are nearly out of time. So I, I want to take this time to thank Mark and Paul for their excellent presentations today. I hope that their wisdom and experience has given you new ways to think about working with your local government officials. As um, both Mark and Paul pointed out, there are lots of tangible outcomes that are reasonable to expect uh, from a positive relationship with your local government. As good food work matures, we really have to act in concert with lawmakers to enact lasting change. I'd also like to thank the Community Food Security Coalition for supporting this webinar. This is the third CFSC-sponsored NGFN webinar. Please feel free to go to our webinar archives and watch the other two in the Linking Diverse Communities Through Healthy Food series. The first aired in March uh, and uh, is uh, talked about uh, examples from the Southwest. And in May, uh, we did examples from metropolitan areas. National Good Food Network webinars are the third Thursday of uh, each month, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. All of our webinars are archived and accessible on the web, ngfn.org slash webinars. Uh, our next webinar is the third Thursday of August, which is the 19th. Subject of that webinar is the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture NIFA program called the Healthy Food Enterprise Development uh, Center, or HUFED. The Wallace Center, which is the coordinating organization, organization for the National Good Food Network is also the manager of the HUFED Center. The mandate for HUFED program is to support greater access to healthy, affordable food in communities across the country. HUFED is unique in that it provides grants and technical assistance for enterprise development and focuses on getting more healthy food, including local food, into communities who have limited access. You'll hear from some current grantees, including the Agricultural and Land-Based Training Association and DC Central Kitchen, both innovative and very exciting organizations. You'll also hear about the Wallace Center's process for exec uh, accepting grant applications for the second year of the program. To register for this webinar, visit ngfn.org slash webinars. We also, again, have this growing archive of uh, past webinars. Uh, there's slides, there's written Q&A, other resources, too. Yet another Wallace Center initiative is the Community Food Enterprise Project. We co-created a report that profiles 24 uh, innovative locally owned food enterprises and analyzed their economic, social, and environmental impacts. Uh, our research demonstrates how food community enterprises have transformed factors that once stymied their performance and profitability, smaller scale, modest ambition, limited local ownership, and high social standards into powerful competitive advantages vis-a-vis -vis multinational food businesses. It also identifies several critical ways CFEs provide invaluable tools for economic development and anti-poverty efforts worldwide. To continue this project, we've thrown our hat into the ring for the Pepsi Refresh Challenge. Uh, visit that URL you see there, refresheverything.com slash community food enterprise. Sign up and vote for this idea. We're behind right now, but each of you can vote once a day. So if you believe in building healthier communities through local food businesses vote each day of July. 
The NGFN wants to keep you updated on the latest in the rapidly, rapidly moving food safety domain as well. Every second Tuesday of the month, we have a food safety conference call led by our food safety coordinator. Anyone is welcome to join in. For more information about our food safety efforts and those conference calls and briefings, uh, ngfn.org slash food safety. You can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, we're at NGFN, uh, and our website, ngfn.org. I'd like to encourage you to add your name, interests, bio, and other information to our growing database of people, organization, and funders, increasing your ability to connect to people within your regions and nationally. We're really starting to push this resource as a place to find people in your region and across regions doing similar and complementary work. This is all part of the NGFN as acting as connector, as Marty talked about. Look for the database link on the resources section of our site or just ngfn.org slash database. And if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage. Uh, please contact us at any time. Our email address is contact at ngfn.org. Uh, the NGFN would like to thank you for your time today. Once again, let me encourage you to fill out that survey. It'll open in your web browser in just a moment. Uh, thank you, and this concludes the webinar.